Uh, good afternoon. Welcome, everybody, to the Minnesota House of Representatives Transportation Finance and Policy Committee for this uh, beautiful day, April 6, 2021. Uh, our first item of business will be for our clerk to take the role to establish a quorum. Mr. Dodge. Chair Hornstein. Present. Hornstein, present. Vice Chair Cagle. Present. Cagle, present. Representative Petersburg. Present. Petersburg, present. Representative Barr. Here. Barr, present. Representative Bernardi. Present. Bernardi, present. Representative Elkins. Elkins, present. Elkins, present. Representative Frederick. Present. Frederick, present. Representative Houseman. Present. Houseman, present. Representative Heinrich. Heinrich, present. Heinrich, present. Representative Cosmic. Present. Cosmic, present. Representative Mason. Mason, present. Mason, present. Representative Murphy. Murphy, present. Murphy, present. Representative Nelson. Nelson, present. Nelson, present. Representative Olson. Present. Olson, present. Representative Richardson. Present. Richardson, present. Representative Torkelson. Present. Torkelson, present. Representative West. Present. West, present. There is a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Dodge. Our next item of business, our approval of the minutes from Friday, March 26, 2021. Is there a motion, Representative Petersburg? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move the minutes of the March 26th meeting. Thank you. The uh, motion is before us. Is there discussion? Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, all those opposed? The motion prevails. Um, members, uh, welcome back. I hope you had a good holiday break. Um, and we have two items of business today. Um, we will hear um, Representative Petersburg's uh, House File 2142 uh, on an informational basis. And then we will um, hear uh, House File 1684, the DE2 amendment, uh, which is the omnibus transportation bill for this session. Uh, we will do a walkthrough of that bill after some um, opening uh, comments that, that I'll provide on that. Um, members, just uh, before we get to House File 2142, uh, just a review of uh, our plan for the week. Um, We'll complete the walkthrough, I hope, by 2.30. If not, we have time. We will we will be convening, reconvening at 5. And if we need to finish up the walkthrough, we'll do it then. Uh, we'll have member questions uh, of the author and um, house research. And then we'll hear from our three agencies that we have jurisdiction over, uh, their comments on the bill this evening. Uh, tomorrow, we'll have public testimony, a brief public testimony. We're asking members of the public to keep their testimony short. Uh, so we can get as many people in as possible that sign up ahead of time. There's um, instructions on our website on how to do that, um, House Transportation Committee website. And then uh, we have a deadline for uh, amendments tomorrow at 1 p.m. And then we will be uh, doing markup from 1 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. on, um, this, uh, on um, Thursday. So uh, uh, that is the plan. Um, for the week. Uh, and Representative Petersburg, I appreciate your bringing uh, House File 2142 uh, to us. Um, I, I hope this is a, a tr this is a new tradition. I hope we'll uh, extend uh, into the future, no matter who is the chair, no matter what party is in the majority. Uh, I think it's really important that um, here as we begin our uh, omnibus bill process that we hear uh, the ideas of the ranking member uh, I don't know of any other uh, finance committee in the House or Senate that is doing it this way. So I'm very pleased. This I think reflects the the um, uh, mutual respect that people on both sides of the aisle on this committee have for one another, uh, and my appreciation for Representative Petersburg's partnership. So um, again, this is uh, a, a bill that we're hearing on an informational basis. I would like Representative Petersburg to again present the ideas. Uh, of the ranking member and uh, his caucus uh, on uh, the key transportation finance uh, goals that we have today. So with that, Representative Petersburg, um, uh, please uh, tell us about House File 2142. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and this really 
it deals primarily with just the financial side of the big ticket items, I guess, uh, as just some ideas, uh, kind of a 30,000 view, 30,000 feet view. And, and it was before we knew what the targets were. And so we had to make a few assumptions. And so uh, it's fairly short. I'll just go over it quickly. Uh, but it deals with just the appropriations um, in which state roads operation maintenance, uh, you can see on page two, uh, 22 million, 25 million program delivery, 14 and 16 between the two years, road construction, 64 and 72. Those are always kind of floating around um, and, and something that uh, your bill also has included. Then the next item is under local roads. Um, we actually took out of um, general fund $15 million, assuming we get at least that target. Uh, 10 million we put into small cities assistance the first year, 3.25 million in general fund for town roads and town bridges, 1.75, which comes up to that $15 million. And then in trunk highway bonds, uh, Mr. Chair, you also put 400 million in, but I think you went into the next biennium. Uh, this we just put into, uh, 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 for this biennium, we split it up at 150 million going to quarters of commerce and 250 million going into road uh, um, bridge, excuse me, the road construction pr program. I think you have a slightly different involvement with that. And then it authorizes the bond sales. Article three on page four uh, starts our uh, just general finance in which we really change the uh, definition or at least specify the definition of what motor vehicle repair and replacement parts are. And I think Mr. Chair, you included that in your bill already. Uh, so I won't go over that part of it. Uh, and then uh, the, the only difference that we have is that currently uh, the, the flat amount that is given from uh, auto parts sales is set at about 52%, but it is a flat amount. Uh, this bill actually went on page six to 60% in which we kept 54% going into the HUTD, 3% uh, going to small cities, 2% going to town roads, and 1% into town bridges, coming to that total of 60%. Uh, we just think it's, it's time for us to start moving that, that um, figure a little bit. And you can see the following um, delineation and elimination exactly of what it, it meant. And, uh, and then I think the following, the last page, page eight, just uh, talks about how the estimates will be determined and when they will go. And in a nutshell, that's the bill, just the high level uh, thoughts on where some of the major financing uh, we think should be. And then uh, Mr. Chair, if you wanna ask questions before I do the amendment, I certainly be glad to do that. Thank you very much, Representative Petersburg. Are there questions of the committee uh, for Representative Petersburg. Um, let me just scan my uh, chat here. Uh, I don't see questions right away. Um, I'll just make a comment and then maybe a question, Representative Petersburg. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, your efforts with this bill. And as you pointed out, um, you know, I'm, I'm struck by a number of uh, important provisions that we have in common, uh, perhaps not at, at the uh, exact same level of funding, but but close um, on on your small cities and town roads, and um, uh, your interest in um, trunk highway bonds and corridors of commerce. Uh, I appreciate that, um, and uh, and I know that the the. 52 to 60 percent is an important part of, of your bill in, in terms of uh, increasing revenue available to us. What what uh, amount um, uh, does that? What is that total in terms of this biennium and the next biennium when we make that percentage increase? And, and if if Mr. Lee has that, if that's easier for Mr. Lee to answer, Representative Petersburg, that's fine too. Yeah, I think um, Mr. Lee might have that. I mean, we, we can calculate knowing what 52, what the, what the dollar amount is, which 52% and would add just the more onto it. But Mr. Lee might have that better answer on. Otherwise I can calculate it quickly. Uh, Mr. Chair, give me just a moment to, to pull up that revenue estimate. 
Okay. Uh, so this is a uh, uh, looking at a revenue note from earlier in session, uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, um, that estimated um, uh, sixty percent of the um, uh, auto parts going to the HUTD. So it's a little bit different in terms of the the distribution here. But if it's sixty percent of um, the total estimated auto parts, uh, then the cost of the general fund would be about twenty eight point um, seven million in fiscal twenty twenty two. 36.1 million in fiscal 23, 42.7 million in fiscal 24, and uh, 49.9 million in 2025. And that's that's a full amount, not including, but if you subtract out what is currently going, it'd be less than that, correct, Mr. Lee? Well, Mr. Chair, that would be the increment above the 145 million a year that is currently going to the HUTD. So that would be the, essentially the general fund cost. Just to be clear, Mr. Lee, um, that that's the that is the figure that was included in the, um, you know, that that was the the 2017 uh, legislation that I think um, authorized um, auto parts sales tax uh, into the HUTD, correct? That, that's, that's where you drive that number. Mr. Chair, uh, committee members, the 145 million is the annual transfer that was set in the 2017 um, legislative first special session. Um, and that's, uh, I think that that started in fiscal 20, um, 2020, I believe, was, right. was the annual transfer. It was about, it's about $12 million a month. Mm -hmm. So that's where we come up with 140 million for the year. And so this would be an additional 24, 28, depending on the year. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Um, are there any other questions for uh, Representative Petersburg? Yeah, I see none. Um, Representative Petersburg, did you wanna talk a little about uh, any, I know that you would uh, posted an amendment. I don't know if you would want to talk about that uh, now or, or wait. Yeah, if, uh, if I could just talk uh, about it briefly, I, I won't spend much time on it. Uh, if, if, if that's okay. Yeah, please proceed, Representative Petersburg. Okay, so so this bill is is what has been known as the salvage title bill, and we've been working on a couple of variations in which I'm trying to pull them together, and I think we're close. So I just want to run through it quickly at this point. Basically, I think it's a it's about public disclosure on vehicles. Uh, currently, uh, vehicles under a certain value or under older than a certain age, uh, if they get totaled out either through flood or whatever uh, rationale, um, they still keep a, main, a clean title, which means that people that are buying them may not be aware of the consequence of of those particular uh, damages. And so, a couple of bills came forward, and this is a combination of both of those in which uh, the other bill included that you needed to specify whether or not the damage was for a particular um, damage, whether it's flood, hail, fire, or collision. And then we also started talking about how we define high value or 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 um, high value or late model. And so we're changing the definition of high value from nine thousand to seven thousand and above and changing the late model from six years in newer to uh, eight years in newer uh, as, as a way to define that. So anything outside of that parameter still would follow the old rules. And so that in a nutshell is, is the case. I also have a slight appropriation in there because the department said, as we have more vehicles, if they are salvage title and they wanna go back on the road, they need to be inspected. And so there is a slight appropriation for one additional uh, uh, inspection site that if it goes on to the main bill, uh, we may have to drop that in order to keep the dollar amount right. But for this amendment, uh, that's it in a nutshell. Um, thank you, Representative Petersburg. And I, I wanna offer my appreciation for a lot of work that you've done uh, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, trying to bridge the divide that exists on this bill. It's not even necessarily a party divide. Um, 
Uh, I think we have members of both parties on different sides right. of this issue. Um, I think members of this com people who are members of this committee in 2017 may recall a very animated committee hearing on salvage title. Um, and Representative Petersburg has legislation on this, but he's been working with um, others uh, to, again, I, I would just describe it, perhaps Representative Petersburg has shuttled diplomacy <laughs> uh, and um, really trying to come up with a uh, agreement that will satisfy uh, the different interested parties uh, that have been at odds over some of the provisions of this bill. And so I hope that um, your public presentation of this amendment um, can provide uh, a framework uh, for an agreement. And um, I know that it's quite possible that you would offer this amendment on Thursday uh, if there is some understanding or agreement. And it would really be a huge breakthrough. This has been um, know, an issue that has been vexing for several years now. And again, a lot of passion on both sides of this question. And um, I appreciate your work on this, Representative Petersburg, and hopefully we can come up with a uh, mutually agreed upon uh, arrangement. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know legal aid is very much interested in, in getting something passed as well. So. Good, I appreciate your work with them and others. Representative Elkins. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, Representative Petersburg, this is a topic I'm, a, I'm kind of interested in as well. Did, did Re Representative O'Driscoll also have a related bill to this this year? Representative Petersburg. Not that I'm aware of. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Representative Joachim and Eric Lucero has, has the other bill and I uh, carried this bill. I'm, I'm not aware of any others, uh, but I could be wrong. Okay, no, I did. And, and was there a standalone bill number? I guess I, I, I'd like to follow up. Uh, I can, I can. Yeah, and Representative Elkins, um, there's there's two bills. Uh, one is, as um, Representative Petersburg mentioned, from Representative Joachim. Yeah. The other is actually authored by Representative Petersburg. Okay. Those are the two bills I'm aware of. I, I can run that down later. Okay, again, just know that it's a Joachim bill and a Petersburg bill. Okay, thank you. Okay, hey members, are there any other questions? Um, Representative Petersburg, do you have any final closing comments on either your amendment or your bill? Uh, no, just uh, thank you for listening to the bill and, and taking into consideration some of the points that we made. And uh, we will move forward in our debate on the main omnibus bill as you present it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Petersburg. Um, members, I'd now like to uh, hand over our virtual gavel to Vice Chair Cagle, and uh, she will. Uh, be in charge of the hearing uh, from now on until 2.30. And then when we reconvene at five, Representative Hausman will have the, uh, the gavel. Uh, Representative Cagle. Thank you, Mr. Chair Hornstein. Um, tell us about the DE2 amendment with your bill and then we'll move on to Mr. Lee and Mr. Burris to help us walk through the spreadsheet and the sections of the DE2 amendment. Uh, members, please raise your hand if you have a technical or clarifying question as Mr. Lee or Mr. Barrett Burris are walking us through the amendment. Um, we'll try to get to your questions as we go. If we miss you, we will return to your question once the walkthrough is completed. Um, and if you have any questions for the author, please um, wait until the end of the walkthrough. So with that, Mr. Chair, go ahead and describe the DE2. Thank you, Madam Chair and members and uh, I'll uh, formally move this bill on Thursday uh, when we do markup. Um, but I did want to make some opening comments now. We won't have, I won't be commenting on Thursday on the bill. So I just wanted to give a, a just a very, very general broad overview here for the next few minutes. And then we'll rely on uh, Mr. Lee and Mr. Burris to, to get into all of the, the details of both the policy and finance aspects of this. Before we do that, speaking of Mr. Burris and Mr. Lee, I, I want to personally thank them for just incredible work uh, that they've done year in and year out, day in and day out for this committee, uh, for all of us on both sides of the aisle. Uh, I just have come to appreciate them more and more every year. Uh, their insights, uh, their advice, their suggestions, uh, their ability to turn things around very quickly, uh, their ability to take people's ideas and translate them into uh, finance and policy is, is extraordinary. So I wanna thank them. I also wanna thank our staff who has been working very, uh, very hard on this bill. Uh, Mr. Howe, Ms. Nelson, 
Um, and Mr. Dodge, uh, thank you for all of your hard work. And of course, Vice Chair Cagle has been uh, very integral to our, our process here. So thanks to all of you. Um, and so members, I, um, as I uh, present this bill, I wanted to um, mention that uh, I've never really dedicated a bill to anybody before, <laughs> but uh, I, I would like to sort of dedicate uh, our work uh, collectively this year uh, to the memory of, of my friend and mentor, Representative Bernie Leader, uh, who chaired this committee uh, many times. Uh, and uh, the reason I mention him, uh, he had passed away uh, this past summer. Um, I felt that any transportation bill uh, should really, I just feel like there's a Bernie Leader test, if you will. And uh, the Bernie Leader test to me is, really does, does the bill do two things? It's a pretty simple test, just as Bernie was fairly uh, straightforward guy. So I think he would hopefully appreciate that there's only two questions that would be posed in a bill in his memory. Number one, uh, does the bill help people across the state? Uh, is it truly statewide? Are, are people in the core cities and the suburbs and greater Minnesota and the regional centers all uh, being assisted and helped in this bill? Um, that is what I strive for. I believe the answer is yes to that. The second question uh, in order to pass, I believe a Bernie leader test is are all modes uh, addressed in the legislation? Um, do we have roads and bridges addressed? Do we have uh, public transportation and active transportation and even passenger rail addressed in this bill? Um, is every mode of transportation freight uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, is that addressed in the legislation? And I believe the answer is yes. It's, it's truly a multimodal bill. And so, you know, in, in that spirit, I, I also um, set some other criteria um, four questions, if you will. <laughs> we just had a Passover celebration where we asked four questions of the staters. So now I'm asking four questions of this bill. Hopefully that uh, we can answer them in the uh, affirmative. Four lenses, if you will. So uh, does the legislation address safety issues adequately? Uh, are we enhancing the safety of our transportation system in, in all ways? Uh, and I believe that we do that, um, both in terms of our infrastructure. Uh, remember the back in January, we had the Stearns County County engineer showed us footage of a bridge literally crumbling and falling apart in Stearns County. And there are hundreds of bridges like that uh, that are fracture critical. That's a safety issue. Uh, we had the Winona County engineer show us a, a rutted county road. Uh, that is a safety issue. It's also um, uh, something that we should not have uh, go unaddressed in our rural communities and really across the entire state. Um, Colonel Langer came and talked about the increase in speeding and the safety issues around that. Um, we provide more resources for the state patrol to address that question. And finally, I was very moved by the hearing we had uh, right before our break. A Representative Sansett had brought local government officials from her area talking about um, the uh, Snowball Lake uh, section around Highway 169 on the Iron Range and numerous fatalities taking place in that uh, in that particular stretch of road. And so we, we address that stretch of road in this bill, but also others in that district uh, that may have safety issues. And of course, uh, uh, across the state, we have many roads that um, are in that category. And so uh, we address safety. Secondly, um, what about the economic development potential of transportation infrastructure investments? Uh, how does transportation aid in our uh, COVID recovery? I believe we answer that question with new resources, new revenue, roads, bridges, public transportation, active transportation. Uh, we know that investments in infrastructure, particularly roads, bridges, and public transit are some of our best bang for our public dollar in terms of return on investment economic return, safety return, job access return. Uh, we have that in our bill. Uh, particularly, we heard testimony uh, that public transportation in particular is a great value for our public investment. And so 
we believe that uh, jobs and uh, economic development are enhanced through this bill. Thirdly, uh, we are on, in a period of uh, racial reckoning in this country and uh, equity issues have to be front and center in anything we do uh, and particularly in transportation. And so we heard on a couple of occasions moving testimony from Reconnect Ronville in terms of uh, how an infrastructure plan uh, can address um, uh, racial equity and inclusion. Uh, we have money set aside for that project. Uh, we heard from people from the disability community and equity issues related to uh, their concerns. Our uh, sales tax for transit will help address long-term uh, chronic funding issues with Metro Mobility. And, and the work that we're doing on pedestrian safety and active transportation has an equity component, as well as our investments in local bus and arterial bus rapid transit to make it easier for people to access jobs. Those are equity issues and uh, they are addressed. And finally, the last lens that I would like us to consider as we evaluate this bill is climate. Uh, we are in the midst of a climate crisis that is accelerating. Uh, Paul Douglas came and testified uh, that the science is in, it's clear, uh, climate, is, uh, climate change is um, accelerating and um, transportation is now the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. Frank Kulesh from the PCA testified, and um, we are not making the gains in addressing that in the transportation sector that we should. And so this bill is a climate-friendly bill that uh, looks at reducing vehicle miles traveled, electrification of our infrastructure, and significant new investments in public transit. Those are all three strategies that will reduce greenhouse gases in the, um, in the transportation sector. And finally, this isn't necessarily one of the four questions, but it's a question I, I want to pose. Um, it goes without saying that we are in uh, fairly uncharted waters when it comes to uh, public discourse and civility. Uh, and I hope that uh, in presenting this bill, uh, which has, um, provisions from both sides of the aisle, uh, I think reflects an excellent working relationship that Representative Petersburg and I have been able to forge. We will have disagreements and we will have profound disagreements, which I think will be aired on Thursday. Uh, but I hope in some small way, uh, this bill can help bridge uh, our growing partisan divide. Uh, some of you may be surprised that we don't have an increase in the um, fee on motor fuels. Uh, we have an inflationary adjustment uh, some of you may be surprised that that's a very profound change from two years ago. And some of you may be surprised that we don't uh, claw back the general fund uh, uh, allocation that was in the 2017 legislation that was referenced earlier. Those are two huge concessions that we have made uh, in an attempt to reach across the aisle and an attempt to make some sort of progress uh, with the Senate to move forward that uh, a, a, true, a, a bill in divided government that we have in Minnesota, I think we're one of two states now with divided government, we are going to have to make concessions to each other's priorities. And so uh, I know that the steep, uh, and while I do support, don't get me wrong members, uh, while I do support a steep increase in the motor fuels uh, fee, uh, as I have in 2019, I still do, I still believe it's appropriate. Um, and while I have profound objections to using general fund money uh, in the HUTD, uh, I understand that those are two issues of great concern to the other side of the aisle. And that's why they're not in here. And I hope that uh, the other side can reach out to us and accept some of the things that you may have problems with so that we can move forward together in some small way. Uh, there is going to be two major federal initiatives on infrastructure that are forthcoming. The recent, the proposal by President Biden, we don't know what final form it will take, but it's a serious and important proposal he made last week. And then we have the reauthorization of the federal transportation bill that's coming up in uh, fall. Uh, and we uh, understand that there may be some state matches that have to uh, uh, be put forward in order to access some of that federal funding, particularly in the reauthorization. This bill positions us to take advantage of those federal opportunities with the new revenue that we have 
both in public transit and in uh, the, uh, the road and bridge area. And I'll just conclude by saying um, it's important, again, circling back to the, the Bernie Leader test. Um, there are some important provisions for both the urban core, the suburban communities, and greater Minnesota and the regional centers in this bill. Um, we have uh, new revenue for small cities. And um, while I know Representative Olson's name may not appear on the spreadsheet, you know, I want to thank him for um, you know, his work on the small cities issue along with Representative Lippert. I think we have a very strong proposal where we take some of that new revenue and use it for small cities and townships. We also add new revenue for greater Minnesota transit uh, through that um, uh, indexing uh, piece that we have uh, and, and, and the transfer from the general fund. So that's critical. Um, and I also failed to mention the, the important equity piece that involves the driver's license for all. And while Representative Kosnick's name may not appear on a spreadsheet, I appreciate uh, his work on that issue as well as the transit safety issue where he added two very important amendments to uh, uh, help move those bills along. Um, Representative Bernardi, thank you for your work on active transportation. Representative Hausman, thank you for your passion on passenger rail and Representative Cagle for all of the hard work that you've done on um, making sure that we have new revenue for roads and bridges in this bill. Uh, and to all of you on both sides of the aisle, um, we've had a great year together. And um, Representative Elkins, I see you for some reason popped up and I, I think you get the award for most provisions in this bill. Uh, you've been at it from before session started last fall, getting your bills in and I appreciate your work. So um, with that members, uh, Representative Richardson, I also wanna thank you for your just passion and, and work on really digging in on the, the land bridge issue and the equity issues uh, as well as uh, bringing forward so many issues related to people with disabilities. That's also an equity, really critical equity issue. So everybody has just made tremendous contributions on both sides of the aisle. And I wanna thank you. And so with that, um, Madam Chair, I'm done with my opening comments and um, uh, I think we can, I'll hand it back to you, uh, Vice Chair Cagle. Thank you, Chair Hornstein. And it looks like we'd like to go to uh, Mr. Lee to walk us through the um, fiscal piece of the bill. Certainly. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. And John, I think it might be helpful to push put up the uh, PDF of the revenue items spreadsheet. So members can follow along. This one, Mr. Lee, or the other one you're referring to? And the other one. I don't know. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, Madam Chair and members, this spreadsheet is a summary of uh, the tax changes proposed in Article uh, 3 of the bill. So, you can get more detail on how the language works and, uh, um, and, and sort of that level of detail in the language if you look at Article 3. But this it shows the fiscal impact. Um, the first piece is a change in the um, motor, fuel, motor fuels tax. And that would be um, that it would be um, the, the current rate would be pegged to an inflator um, that is maintained by the Federal Highway Administration for highway construction cost or the highway construction cost index. Um, based off of past um, trends with that index, the estimated change in the percent rate um, can be seen on line three. That's the cumulative rate change from the current uh, 28 and a half cent um, fuels tax. And then the year over year change can be seen on line four. Um, so that there's the estimated revenue uh, from those changes on line five. And then uh, in current law, there's a few requirements around um, uh, service stations that border states that have uh, lower uh, fuels tax rates. Um, and so that you can see that credit on line six. And also a portion of the fuels tax uh, by statute is directed towards DNR uses that are attributable to um, 
ATVs, um, off-road vehicles, and uh, go to DNR accounts for forest and park roads. Then moving down the spreadsheet on um, the registration tax changes, um, and again, for detail on, on kind of how these uh, changes work, you can go to Article 3, um, but uh, there's a change in the depreciation schedule for motor vehicles in the first um, four years of the 10-year um, window of the registration tax. Um, so that change keeps them at a slightly higher rate. Um, and, uh, um, and in addition to that, there's also a high value vehicle surcharge. I um, mean, you see the estimates of revenue on lines 13 and 14 for those two items. Um, and I should say both the fuels tax and the registration tax proceeds are dedicated 100% to the HUTD with the exception of the um, qualifying station credit and the uh, DNR transfers. Then moving down, uh, there's also a change in the motor vehicle sales tax rate. So currently the motor vehicle sales tax uh, applies just to motor vehicles. It does not include uh, the legacy amount um, or the, that rate. And it, the current law uh, motor vehicle sales tax is at 6.5%. In the proposed DE amendment in Article 3, there is a change of that rate to 6.875%. Um, and that incremental increase is then divided into two ways and per the um, uh, Minnesota Constitution between the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund, which is 60%, and 40%, which uh, goes to transit. On line 20 is the uh, change um, that goes to the HUTD. So those three changes add up to line 24. And um, then there's one other piece um, that has to do with HUTD. And John, if you could scroll down a little bit to the auto parts uh, to read sales tax. So as the committee was discussing earlier, um, since the 2017 legislature, um, a portion of the sales tax, general sales tax attributable to auto parts has uh, it been statutorily directed towards the HUTD. Um, and that amount is on line 28, so 145.6 million a year. What the proposal in this DE amendment would do is direct a piece of that HUTD amount on line 30, 31, and 32 uh, to some different uh, uh, uses. Um, small cities on line 30, and I should note that those percentages that you can see there are the percentage of the 145 million. And there's a sort of a phase in amount um, in fiscal 22, 23, uh, and then township roads and greater Minnesota transit. And you can see how much each of those uh, uses receive. That is totaled on line 34 as the uh, decrease in HUTD from auto parts. But on line 35, that's the remaining amount of, of auto parts that's still going to HUTD. So if you add line 24 and line 34 together, there's still a net increase to the HUTD that's on line 38. And those next few lines, um, John, if you could scroll down a bit, is the calculation of the constitutional formula of the highway user um, tax distribution fund to um, the Trunk Highway Fund, County State Aid, Municipal State Aid Streets, and the 5% set aside for the flexible highway and township roads and bridges. And that line 45 is in addition to the HU, or to the auto parts change above. Then scrolling down a little bit further to the next page. Uh, so as I said earlier, there's the, the rate change, the motor vehicle sales tax, that increment for transit can be found on line 51. And for transit, there's a further division um, with, between Greater Minnesota Transit and Metro Area Transit that can be found on lines uh, 32 and 33. And then the last uh, uh, tax item in the DE is on starting on line 55, and that's the um, uh, a 0.5 percent sales tax um, in a subset of the Twin Cities metropolitan area that is the cities that are currently within the transit uh, capital uh, taxing district. Um, and so that is sort of like the, the um, a, a subset of cities within, within the seven counties. Um, and it mostly doesn't include like 
uh, uh, further out um, either townships or towns. Um, so the estimated revenue raised is on line 57. And you can see in fiscal year 2022, that's 109 million. And that's because the um, tax would start in January 1 of calendar 2022. And so that would be half of the state fiscal year. And then you can see um, during full years that would generate between 266 million and 271 million a year. Um, and then scrolling down, I won't cover these too much. These are just tables showing the, this change compared to current resources for the various funds and uses that I mentioned earlier. And John, if you could move on to the appropriations tracking spreadsheet. Thanks. And, and for members, it, it might be uh, best to print this off on a legal size piece of paper if, if you can, it's a little easier to follow along. And just to get your bearings on, on how this appropriations tracking spreadsheet works, this reflects the appropriations in, um, the first, in Article 1 of the bill. And um, in the language, there typically isn't a distinction over whether or not a funding amount is an increase or a decrease. And so the spreadsheet tries to give members a sense of, of kind of what the historic funding levels have been and what is being proposed in the DE. Uh, very quickly, uh, if you look at the top of the uh, page on the upper left-hand side, you can see column A is a brief description of uh, the program or the change item. Column B is the fund. Then column C is the uh, funding level for the current biennium or the current two years um, that was set in the 2019 session. And the base that was set for this session and the tails um, in the 2019 session, columns F and I. And then the governor's recommendations in columns J through N. And then the uh, or the um, the DE amendment before the committee in columns O through U. So you can see in column J and O that the governor and this um, DE amendment also makes uh, changes to the appropriation in fiscal 2021, which is the fiscal year that we are currently in. So really quickly, um, I'll just highlight various change items. So that's uh, the first one that you'd see is on line 21. Um, that is a proposed change in, in funding level. Uh, the ones that the items that don't have uh, change items are at the base amount set uh, two years ago. Uh, so on line 21, this is a governor's rec for um, an increase in the aeronautics fund um, related to unmanned uh, uh, aerial or drone enforcement. Um, then moving down to lines 35 and 36, um, the first one, line 35, is a governor's recommended, recommended increase from the Trunk Highway Fund for administering Greater Minnesota Transit. And then on line 36 is a, uh, a provision in, unique to this DE uh, that's uh, $3.4 in one-time general fund appropriation for active transportation. Then moving on to uh, safe routes to school, there is a um, $1.5 million one-time increase in that appropriation. The base is 500,000 that you can see online uh, 42. And so for one year that becomes 2 million and then it goes back to the base amount of 500,000 for FY23 and the tails. And in, in case uh, uh, um, I, I hadn't said this earlier, the tails refers to uh, the next biennium. So that's fiscal years 24 and 25. And then the final change items on this page are on line 35 and 34. Um, well, excuse me, the, the line 35 is a governor's change item that the DE did uh, not uh, include. And, how, and line uh, 54 is a uh, item in this DE that is um, 2.5 million in one-time appropriation for from the general fund for an appropriation for the second train uh, to Chicago. And then John, if you could go to the next page. Uh, so under freight, uh, there's two governor's uh, change items. There are um, increases uh, for the freight appropriation that are in the, included in this DE amendment. And then uh, there is another item included in this DE amendment for electric vehicle infrastructure on um, that would set a new appropriation um, from the Special Revenue Fund on line 74. And I'll get into this a little bit uh, later, but 
part of the, if you look at column P, uh, the 2.47 million is a, um, uh, that's partly supported by general fund transfer that happens later in the spreadsheet and later in the bill. Um, and then um, the 344,000 and 340 to 537,000 uh, amount in the tails is based off of a change that is later in the bill um, that directs a portion of the surcharge that electric vehicles pay rather than it going to the HUTD to electric vehicle infrastructure. So this is the direct appropriation for electric vehicle infrastructure. Then moving on to state roads, um, you can see a number of governor's change items on line 88, 89, and 90, um, and then an appropriations increase line on line 91. Uh, so typically, uh, unless there are specific riders, um, so that's where the language after the appropriation specifies a dollar amount. Um, uh, there, there isn't, it, it doesn't require, if, if a rider isn't there, it doesn't require an agency to do something um, that is outside the, uh, the specifications of the appropriation. Um, so in, in these cases, um, uh, absent that, you typically just see an appropriations increase um, with a few exceptions. Um, but on line, D, line 91, um, this would fund the governor's uh, recommended level of line 88 and 90, uh, plus some additional revenue that is based off of the increase in revenue from the three uh, taxes that increase funds to the HUTD. And this is for uh, state roads operations and maintenance. Um, and then going down to uh, the next state roads item, planning and research, there's a one-time general fund appropriation um, in this category of 6.2 million for the 94 uh, Rondo Freeway cab planning and design in fiscal 2022. And $500,000 one-time appropriation for the first MnDOT district uh, for a highway um, corridor planning that is ridered in the appropriation and then an appropriations increase that matches the governor's level on line 102. And then John, if you could move to the next page, please. All right. Uh, so um, then there's a number, as you can see on line 112 through 114, there's a number of governor's change items and then the appropriations increase uh, that's in this DE. Uh, that funds it at the governor's level plus an amount because of the revenue increase um, for program delivery. And then for state road construction, and this is the largest appropriation for MnDOT, uh, there's a recognition of federal funds on line 142, and then a increase that is the result of the revenue uh, changes in the tax article um, on line 125. Uh, and I usually won't mention base amounts, but so an example of not changing the bases is, is on line 129 for courts of commerce, and that maintains the $25 million a year appropriation that's in, in the DE. Um, as was mentioned earlier, there is a authorization of $400 million in trunk highway bonds. Um, in the bill, it author, or authorized in fiscal year 2024, so on line 135, you can see the debt incremental debt service increase that is required to cover those additional bond authorizations. And then uh, moving down to state radio communications, there is the governor's recommended funding level increase from the trunk highway fund and separating out what was formerly a rider for 300,000 for a radio tower on Lake of the Isles um, that just becomes its own line in the bill language. Uh, then John, if you could move on to the next page. All right, for local roads, these are a result of the constitutional formula from the revenue increases in Article Three. Um, so kind of the, the math behind how, how those money flow um, on line 167 for county state aid highways and on line 176 for municipal state aid streets. And then there's a new appropriation for small cities on line 183 uh, this is from the special revenue fund, which is sort of where the, the, the accounting, where, where those dollars would go um, that, are, that come, would come from the auto parts uh, 
attributable sales tax. Um, so you can see that that amount uh, on line 183. Then for MnDOT agency management, um, there is a uh, rider change that's on line 189. That's the governor's recommended um, change of 100,000 a year from the general fund for tribal training assistance. And then um, on line 199, that amount is the governor's recommended increase uh, for uh, lines 169 and 167, but there's no rider language, so it just shows up as an appropriations increase, but it is at the governor's re requested level. Then, John, if you could move to the next page, please. Uh, so, um, on line for buildings, on line uh, 208 is the governor's recommended funding increase for buildings. And then on uh, line 211 is the governor's recommended level of increase, but no specific riders. So it just shows up as an appropriations increase, but it's at the governor's requested level. Um, and then on line 229, there is a, in, um, in the appropriations article, there is a requirement that MnDOT cancel 271,000 in general fund spending from fiscal 2021. Uh, this was part of a um, uh, the executive branch required administrative holdbacks of all uh, executive agencies um, from the general fund. And so essentially this, this money will be canceled and this is recognizing that cancellation. There's also one for the DPA or Department of Public Safety, Safety later in the bill. Uh, then moving down to the Metropolitan Council, uh, this funding level is largely the base funding level set uh, in the budget bill two years ago, uh, with a few changes in the transit systems operations appropriation. On line 244, uh, there's a uh, bus emission study that will be done by the MPCA that costs 32,000 a year. Uh, and then some one-time items on line 240, lines 245, 246, and 247, uh, with 300,000 for the I-94 or I-494 quarter travel demand management organization, uh, 250,000 for a highway 55 tra uh, quarter transit study, and 500,000 for zero emissions transit vehicle transition. Um, then the base level of funding for Metro Mobility on line 251. Uh, then moving to the next page, uh, thank you, John. Um, so there's only one change item on this page, and this uh, for members is the uh, administrative portions of the Department of Public Safety. And uh, a little bit of background, the Department of Public Safety uh, Legislative Committee jurisdiction is shared with the Public Safety Committee, and the Transportation Committee has jurisdiction over the administrative components of public safety, uh, the State Patrol, uh, the Department of Driver and Vehicle Services, and the Department, or and the um, oil, and, or excuse me, uh, pipeline safety. So this is just a portion of the total agency that the Transportation Committee has jurisdiction over. So the one change item here is a governor's recommended change that increases um, uh, uh, in public safety support um, that is a operating adjustment in um, the, that adds to 135,000 for the biennium and increase. And as I mentioned before, uh, with MnDOT, there's a administrative holdback and recognition of a cancellation from fiscal 2021. And you can see that in column O. Um, then John, if you could move to the next page, please. All right, and so this is the state patrol's main appropriation for patrolling highways. Uh, most the base appropriation is largely from the trunk highway fund. And you can see that base amount on line 294, and then the change items below. Uh, so there's a number of governor's recommended change items, and the House, um, uh, as with many MnDOT appropriations, does not have specific riders for this appropriate for uh, this appropriations increase, but funds it at the governor's level for lines 300, 301, and 302. And 300 is um, in recognition of the 8.4% salary increase. For the state patrol uh, under this appropriation. And then on line 301 is uh, for uh, body worn cameras for the state patrol. And on line 302 is a governor's revised rec for um, state patrol investments that is um, adding additional sworn officers. 
And I should also note that they're um, under this appropriation, um, not in appropriations language, but uh, there's an allowance for a $1.7 million uh, extension of an appropriation made in fiscal 2021 uh, for a trooper academy. But it, it, it's not a new, new spending. It's just allowing previously authorized spending to continue. Uh, and there's also 1.166 million in additional spending in fiscal 2021 for the uh, patrolling highways. Uh, then moving down to commercial vehicle enforcement, this is another part of, um, of the state patrol. There's the governor's recommended funding level of increase uh, that you can see online, 318, that's the combination of the body-worn cameras and the salary increase. Then moving down to capital security, uh, there's a fiscal 2021 appropriation of 1.512 million um, in the current fiscal year. And then the governor's recommended funding level uh, for um, the operating adjustment for capital security, um, as with the other components of, of uh, the state patrol um, uh, salary increase um, body-worn cameras, and additional FTEs specific to the uh, state capital. Um, and then, John, if you could move to the next page, please. As the final unit of the state patrol, there's the governor's recommended funding increase for um, the salaries and body-worn cameras, um, and an additional $100,000 appropriation in the current fiscal year. And this is paid out of the HUTD rather than the Trunk Highway Fund or General Fund. Uh, then moving on to the Department of Driver and Vehicle Services. First, driver services, and these are paid out of special revenue accounts that are generated from fees uh, from transactions with uh, DVS. Um, so there is um, the governor's level of um, funding increase plus some um, additional funding under driver services on line 356. Uh, that additional amount includes uh, one rider language, one rider that I actually forgot to put on the spreadsheet uh, that was um, 170,000 in the first year for implementation of changes in driver eligibility. Um, and the appropriation amount also includes uh, some other um, uh, uh, costs from bills heard in the committee and that has been related to policy language in the bill. Um, then moving on to vehicle services, uh, there is um, the governor's recommended level of funding increase, and as I mentioned before, um, also a higher level of funding in recognition of other requirements in the bill, uh, one of them including the um, 150000 in the first year for implementation of self-service kiosks. Um, then there is also a governor's recommended um, funding for one-time staffing of $2.4 million from the vehicle services account. Uh, and for a little bit of background on this, this was authorized in the legislature last year, um, but uh, because of the COVID pandemic, uh, the, the, it was not spent. Um, so um, there's that. So if you could move to the next page, please, John. Um, so this is another operating adjustment on line 393 for traffic safety at the governor's recommended funding level. And then um, a one-time general fund appropriation of 3.195 million uh, for a hazardous substance transportation incident preparedness. And that completes DPS. And so then um, as a result of uh, tax changes, um, uh, that I mentioned earlier, and an additional item that was also a governor's recommendation for um, uh, bonding authority for the Metropolitan Council that incurs a property tax change in the seven count or in the a subset of the seven county metro area. Um, there's some things called tax interactions, and um, they're essentially what happens when uh, tax rates change in one area and have an impact or offsetting effect on aids or spending um, in other tax areas. So on line 416 is a tax interaction related to uh, the property tax change. And so essentially the, this is in recognition of um, a change in uh, renters or homeowners uh, property um, tax aids. And then as a result of the fuels tax changes, um, there's also an interaction with um, 
uh, counties that have casinos, um, that host casinos, um, have a uh, general fund uh, aid set such uh, depending on the rate of the motor fuels tax. So this is in recognition of that aid to counties with casinos. And then John, if you could move on to the next page. Uh, so this is the revenue page and this rather than showing spending shows either revenue changes or, um, or, uh, or, or impacts um, and also transfers between funds. Uh, so um, it can be a little confusing, but uh, the numbers that show up um, that are positive here are a um, revenue increase and the numbers that show up in parentheses are a negative or a revenue decrease. So it's sort of the opposite of, of what you saw on the uh, um, first few pages of the spreadsheet. So the first one is uh, mentioned earlier related to policy, uh, policy provision on unmanned aircraft system enforcement. Um, the, uh, this is a governor's rec and is in anticipation of uh, reven a revenue increase to the aeronautics fund. And then there is both a governor's rec and an item that is included in this VE, though um, slightly modified uh, for electric vehicle surcharge. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the governor's recommendation and the language in this DE contains a provision that uses a portion of the surcharge on electric vehicles and directs it towards electric vehicle infrastructure. So that shows up as a loss to the highway user tax distribution fund or parentheses on line uh, 436 and then an increase to the special revenue fund on line 437. And then as I mentioned earlier, there's also a general fund transfer shows up as a loss to the general fund on line 238 and a gain to the special revenue fund on line 239. Uh, moving on, there's a governor's recommend, recommendation that is also in the DE that would use a part of the fines collected um, for uh, citations um, uh, or traffic citations. And rather than that being deposited in the trunk highway fund, be directed towards grade crossing safety replacement devices. So that's a loss to the trunk highway fund on line 441. And again, to the um, uh, rail safety special revenue fund account on line 442. And then <clears throat> there is also a governor's rec and a item included in the DE. Uh, that would increase the number of inspectors um, for uh, railroads. And this is paid for by a railroad assessment. And so you can see the um, revenue from that assessment on line 443. Um, on line 445 and 446 is recognition of federal dollars um, uh, uh, going to MnDOT for, trans or for transportation. Um, and then um, on lines 448 through 457 is some of the calculations for um, uh, the sort of the the, uh, the the table that I showed earlier. This is a little harder to read, um, but I, I have to show it. Um, and I will note that there's I did find one error on line uh, 457 that 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 number wouldn't match the Greater Minnesota Transit amount. So that, for example, on line. Uh, um, or on column P, that should be closer to 700,000. So I'll be cleaning that up in the next version of the spreadsheet. Um, there's one other tax item that I'm still waiting to hear back from revenue on, and that's on line 458. Um, that is a uh, provision that um, uh, has an impact on vehicle rental uh, tax change, or a, is a tax change. Um, and uh, there would be a slight impact to the highways your tax distribution fund, but I won't know until there is a uh, revenue note from Department of Revenue on that. And then moving on to the public safety uh, area, um, there's a governor's recommendation uh, for deposit of confiscated money uh, or abandoned money, excuse me, and the general fund. And you can see that on line 461. Then some governor's recommended items that are also included in the DE online uh, for 462 and 463 related to modifying fees uh, for driver's license suspensions. And then on line uh, 465 uh, through 468 are um, uh, changes to um, uh, some DVS fees um, and uh, trip permits. Uh, these are largely governor's recommended items. 
online, and this is specific to the DE amendment online, um, 469 and 467 is a transfer from the vehicle services account in the special revenue fund to the driver services account. Um, the driver services account was a little bit lower um, and below the, uh, uh, the, the fund target. And so um, this transfer uh, balanced out those two funds. Um, and then there's also a transfer from the vehicle services account to the general fund um, in fiscal 2024. That's on line 471 and 472. Uh, then there's a few more tax interactions. Uh, the first one on line 475 is related to the Metropolitan Council transit capital borrowing. Uh, and then on line 276 and 277 are the recognition of some other um, uh, fuels tax related uh, tax interactions. Or, and excuse me, 477 is a registration tax interaction. And then John, if you can move to the next page, uh, this is a summary of the revenue change items. And if you can go to the last page there. Uh, this is a summary of the general fund change items or the general fund level of funding, I should say, and the change from base. So if you go down to line uh, 529, this includes all of the spending changes um, and revenue changes to the general, specific just to the general fund. So you can see the governor's changes in fiscal year 2021 and 2022 and 2023 is a $28.747 million change from base. And the DE amendment is a 39.603 change from base. And then you can see the target and the difference and um, a summary of the trunk highway bond authorization below. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Lee. I see um, Representative Petersburg has a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lee. Always uh, detailed uh, as always. Uh, do just double checking, what is the net in the second biennium 24, 25 in the tails? Does, does that balance out as well? I haven't had a chance to add them all up. Mr. Lee? Certainly, uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Petersburg, the change in the tails is a $16 million increase in the general fund over base. 16.038 to be precise. Representative uh, Petersburg? Yeah, thank you. So are, are we talking that uh, there's going to be $16 million more in next biennium uh, that can be spent on, on uh, transportation items? Mr. Lee. <clears throat> Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Petersburg, that's correct. The the base sets uh, the funding level or the the tails target or excuse me the this bill sets the base level of spending in the tails. It doesn't appropriate money um, in the tails, but it sends it sets what in two years the legislature will consider sort of the starting point or the base. And so the DE amendment proposes that um, for fiscal 2024 and 2025, it is 16 million dollars higher than the current. Uh, base amount. And uh, most of those increases, um, a, a large piece of those increases relate to uh, the um, capital security changes under DPS specific to or within the state patrol. And I, I can add up exactly how much that is in just a second. No, that, that's okay for now, Mr. Lee. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Petersburg. Is there, I don't see any other questions. I'll give it a minute if um, anybody has any uh, further questions for Mr. Lee. Representative Kosnick. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, could you just talk a little bit, Mr. Lee? You'd mentioned the qualifying uh, station credit. Um, I think I'd get the general uh, about that, but uh, I haven't heard much about that. Could you just explain how that works? Uh, for the gas tax increase? Mr. Lee. Certainly, Mr. Chair and Representative Kosnick. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm just reading from the uh, Department of Revenue um, preliminary revenue note on this, and they explained that uh, it's a credit to provide, uh, provided for gasoline um, uh, that is um, delivered to a station within 7.5 miles of a border uh, to a state that has a um, excise gas tax rate of um, three cents per gallon more than the tax or 
in which Minnesota has a rate that is three cents per gallon more than the uh, tax that is in the state that is contiguous to that service station within um, 7.5 miles. Representative Kosnick. Thank you. So if you want to fill up with gas, you get save a little bit of money uh, at the border. Is that the deal? Mr. Lee. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and Representative Kosnick, uh, yeah, I think it depends on uh, the, the state that the, the border would apply because I believe Wisconsin and Iowa has either a higher or, or pretty close uh, rate. I think it's South Dakota and, and North Dakota that are the, the lower rates. Representative Kosnick? Uh, great. That's kind of what I was looking for, some clarification on that. And uh, I think I'll have another question for Mr. Burris later. Thank you. I don't see any other questions, so um, perhaps we can move on to Mr. Burris. Uh, Madam Chair, members, I will be walking through the H1684 DE2 amendment, and I'll, uh, I'll step through the sections of, of the amendment. Uh, article 1 is the appropriations article, and I won't go into uh, much detail on that since Mr. Lee just walked through uh, all the uh, appropriations, the spending authority for uh, fiscal year 21, as well as the upcoming biennium uh, and, uh, and transfers. I'll just touch on a couple of aspects of it. Uh, the first section in Article 1 uh, lays out the structure for the appropriations article and defines some terms establishing that, uh, among other things, that. Uh, the default appropriation is from the trunk highway fund. And that's a, a bit different from what you might see in other budget areas. The trunk highway fund is, is sort of the starting point rather than the general fund. Uh, section two is the uh, uh, appropriations to the Department of Transportation to MnDOT. And it uh, makes the various appropriations across the areas that, uh, that Mr. Lee had, had walked through. Uh, there are also a number of provisions around transfers uh, carry forward authority, uh, some contingent appropriations if there's uh, additional revenue or revenue adjustments, um, and some flexibility around uh, spending, shifting shifting dollars between uh, the first year and the second year of the biennium, uh, as well as uh, legislative reporting requirements. And then section three is the makes the appropriations to the Metropolitan Council for transportation related. Uh, functions of the of the council so uh, transit operations and metro mobility section four contains the appropriations to the department of public safety the administrative functions uh, as well as the, the state patrol driver and vehicle services and a couple other offices within the department and then section five contains the the transfers that mr lee had outlined between a couple of, of, of accounts and also involving the general fund and section six contains fiscal year 2021 administrative holdback um, cancellations or cancellations that reflect the, the holdbacks um, in, the, in the current fiscal year. Uh, section seven sets requirements for the structure for the budget that is uh, proposed by the executive branch in the next plan and the next time around. And then finally, in this article, uh, section eight provides an extension of spending authority to the state patrol from a 2019 appropriation so that uh, funds could continue to be used into part of fiscal year 2022 for a uh, state patrol trooper academy. Uh, moving then to article two, this article contains trunk highway bonding authority and appropriations. Uh, section one is, is kind of similar to the, the structure for the appropriations article lays out some definitions and, and structural um, design for, for the article. Uh, section two contains the core, which is uh, appropriations of trunk highway bond proceeds to MnDOT. Uh, that is split 175 million for the quarters of commerce program and 225 million for state road construction. That's just general state road construction. Uh, both of those are made available in fiscal year 2024, so there's a little bit of a, a delay relative to the, the upcoming biennium, biennial budget. Uh, section three, also in this article, uh, makes an appropriation to MMB for bond management expenses, 
And then finally, section four contains the actual authorization to uh, sell and issue trunk highway bonds. Moving then to article three, uh, this article contains uh, the various transportation related taxes. Again, I'll just touch on them uh, fairly briefly and can always return back if there are questions, but Mr. Lee had outlined the, the in discussion of the revenue sheet um, the, these provisions. Um, section one is a conforming change. Uh, section two is a definitional update that goes along with the, the, the substantive change found in section three, which is a couple of modifications to the registration tax involving uh, a higher rate for some higher value vehicles, as well as some adjustments to the depreciation schedule for vehicles in, in some of the earlier years of life. Uh, section four contains the reallocation of revenue from an electric vehicle surcharge so that 50% uh, up to a million um, per year uh, goes into a new electric vehicle infrastructure account that's being established in the bill. And there's a director appropriation in Article 1 um, from that account, as well as programmatic language that's elsewhere in the bill. Next, uh, sections 5 and 6 modify the motor fuels tax rates based on uh, indexing um, using a cost index um, that is uh, produced federally, National Highway Construction Cost Index. And then uh, section seven contains a reallocation of revenue gen from the general sales tax that's attributed to auto parts. And this lays out a, a percentage-based reallocation of the share of that revenue that currently is deposited in the highway user tax distribution fund. Uh, this section also contains some, some technical changes to, to restructure uh, the definitions and establish subdivisions. Um, next is uh, section eight, which is a, another conforming change. It goes along with uh, section nine, which uh, directs the Metropolitan Council to impose a transit sales tax within the transit taxing district. And um, the section lays out uh, the you know, general administrative requirements that are uh, parallel to um, other local option, local area uh, sales taxes. Um, it identifies use of funds for transit generally um, and in, in alignment with uh, transportation policy planning. Um, lays out a couple of administrative requirements. And the provision also includes authority for the Metropolitan Council to issue bonds that would be backed by the uh, sales tax, the sales tax revenue stream. Uh, section 10 contains the rate increase from 6.5 to 6.875 for the motor vehicle sales tax. And section 11 is, is the other change to the motor vehicle sales tax. And this creates an additional surcharge on an increment of the sales price of motor vehicles. That, um, that increment would uh, start at uh, sales prices that are more than double the average sales price. That's at a rate of, of 4%. Uh, and then the last piece of uh, the, the Article 3 is a phase in. It sets some alternative percentages of the reallocation of um, uh, general sales tax attributed to auto parts revenue for the first, for the upcoming two fiscal years. So, what you um, see earlier in the statutory language would be in place you know, on an ongoing basis, but for fiscal years 22 and 23, we've slightly adjusted the uh, percentage um, distribution is going to the same sources, but in differing amounts, and that's uh, laid out in section 12. Um, and then article four, I'll just pause for a second. There. Excuse me. <clears throat> article four uh, contains a series of sections that uh, are reflective of a bill from Representative Winkler on driver's license eligibility as well as uh, documentation requirements to obtain uh, a driver's license or identification card uh, without demonstrating lawful legal presence in the United States. Uh, section one is a conforming change on data practices. Uh, section two is also a conforming change on um, uh, updating references. Uh, section three um, 
eliminates a certification requirement as part of the application process. Uh, one of the core elements of, of the proposal is found in section four, and this um, uh, specifies that a person isn't required to demonstrate lawful presence. It also um, establishes that some of the administrative rules around uh, uh, documentation and, and establishment of, of legal presence don't apply for applicants for a, a non-compliant uh, license or identification card. And in the, in the statutory uh, terminology, non-compliant refers to a license or ID card that, that doesn't meet all, all, all requirements of the Federal Real ID Act. Uh, section five, uh, along with uh, section six and seven, lay out the documentation requirements and um, essentially broaden the list of the types of documents that can be used to establish identity, date of birth, and Minnesota residency when applying for a non-compliant card. And then after that, uh, sections eight and nine establish for driver's licenses and for identification cards, marking requirements um, for those who, who do not um, demonstrate legal presence when um, applying for a uh, ID card or driver's license, or as well as for those who have a, a temporary authorized um, status to, for um, presence in, in the US. Uh, the next uh, series of sections, sections 10, 11, and 12, cover data practices issues around those who have applied for a license in, in these contexts. Uh, the, the core requirements are found in section 12, and it's largely a set of restrictions on data sharing. Section 13 repeals a limitation on administrative rulemaking that's, that's currently in place that prevents the Department of Public Safety from going through administrative rule um, or going through a, a, a rulemaking process that um, uh, it would involve changes to driver's license requirements. Um, and finally, the uh, changes in this article are made effective October 1 for licenses issued on or after that date. Uh, moving next to Article 5, there are a series of changes from a, a couple of different bills that had been heard in committee earlier this session in transportation that involve bicycles, electric assisted bicycles, and other active transportation provisions. Uh, section, the, the first series of sections, sections one, uh, two, and three refer to uh, definitions in a, a vehicle to exclude a, more explicitly electric assisted bicycles from, from uh, vehicle types, uh, more in the statutory DNR world, if you will. Uh, section four is part of a, a series of, of or, related set of definition changes to centralize and update uh, uh, types of um, bikeway and uh, pathway definitions in state statute. Uh, section five is a directive to the um, uh, Department of, of um, uh, MnDOT, the Department of Transportation uh, regarding assistance to local units of government um, and then following that, there are a couple of sections that uh, uh, relate to state bicycle routes, including uh, establishing um, or designating more formally uh, the existing uh, trail, Mississippi River Trail as a state bicycle route and establishing a Jim Overstar bikeway as a, as a state um, bicycle route as well. Um, Section nine is another uh, definition uh, update to specify that electric assisted bicycles are not included as part of the general definition in, in uh, the motor vehicle registration statutes. And then uh, section 10 is a special license plate authorized the pedal Minnesota special plates lays out eligibility uh, design requirements provides for plate transfer um, as well as uh, disposition of contributed funds that would be um, a, a donation that would be made as part of application for the plate. Uh, sections 11 and 12 are uh, additional 
uh, definition updates to, for bikes and bikeways. Um, part of the effect of the change in section 11 is to uh, establish that bicycle lanes uh, include shoulders. Uh, and then sections 13 through 16 update the definitions for electric assisted bicycles, creating a couple of, or three different classifications of, of e-bike based on the, the motorized capability of, of, uh, of the device. Um, section 17 is another uh, update to definitions on motor vehicles involving electric assisted bicycles. And uh, section 18 creates a new definition in traffic regulations that goes along with uh, uh, bicycle regulation uh, operating rules updates that are also in this article. Speaking of those, uh, section 19, along with uh, sections 20 and 21, have a series of changes on riding rules for bicycles. Um, and then section uh, 21 has, a, has a, a technical shift of some language involving electric assisted bicycles that's um, substantially reproduced in section 22, which uh, again, refers to riding rules. And this is for uh, updates to electric assisted bicycles. Section 23 also deals with e-bikes in setting some equipment and labeling requirements. Uh, following that, section 24 reestablishes a committee and renames it the Active Transportation Advisory Committee. This was something that had been in place in state statute a few years ago and expired. This would put it um, back into place uh, compared to the, to the, the prior language would, uh, revise some of the duties. Uh, the statute specifies membership and some of the administrative provisions um, requires an annual reporting to uh, MnDOT and would have it expire at, um, at the end of uh, fiscal year 2031. Mr. Burris, we have about two minutes left and, I, um, and members, we will be reconvening at five o'clock. So um, there will be time for um, questions. Do you think you, uh, Mr. Burris, do you think you'll be able to get through the rest of it in two minutes? Not at this rate, no, Madam okay. Chair. Rep Madam Rep Chair. Chair Hornstein. Uh, Madam Chair, yes. I it, I think that, um, you know, we'd ha we have sufficient time, I believe, uh, at five o'clock for Mr. Burris to finish the walkthrough, have questions, and then have uh, testimony from state agencies. So it's, I think, important for folks to hear from Mr. Burris and sure. the complete uh, testimony that he has. But. Uh, Madam Chair, I might uh, I might just touch on the last couple of sections to wrap up this article. Perfect. Stopping point. Uh, so Section 25 revises a requirement on use of uh, a portion of federal funds to um, kind of update and, and increase the threshold of uh, uh, dollars that we need to go towards transportation alternatives projects. Um, and then Section 26 is a technical change that involves centralizing bike related definitions. And then finally, the, the, um, all of the uh, active transportation and bicycle related provisions would be made effective on August 1st of this year. And with that, Madam Chair, uh, maybe Article 6 could be taken up. Uh, in, in, in At five o'clock? Sounds good. Um, so we have about 30 seconds remaining. So um, just want to remind members that we will be back at five o'clock this evening um, where Mr. Burris will um, wrap up the walkthrough and then we'll have um, time for additional questions. Um, Chair Hornstein, is there anything you'd like to add? You're on mute. Yeah, sorry. I want to thank members and thank uh, our nonpartisan staff and look forward to more discussion at five o'clock. Thank you. And with that, members, we are in recess.